This is Titan, the largest moon of Saturn and the sixth moon ever to be discovered. Like Io, Enceladus and our own moon, Titan is hands down one of the most interesting moons in our solar system. I could talk for hours about how fascinating this moon is and still not come close to covering everything about it. Hence, this video is an introduction to Titan, providing everything you need to know for future, more in-depth videos about the moon's more intriguing features. So let's jump right into Titan 101. Titan was discovered in 1655 by a wealthy Dutch astronomer called Christian Huygens, but you Yanks will know him as Christian Huygens, so that's what I'm going to call him from now on. Now Huygens was a genius, and not only did he find this moon using a telescope he built himself, but he also tailored it to the latest in refraction technology, using the very techniques he had just discovered. Huygens initially named his find Saturni Luna, which is Latin for Saturn's moon, a practical but very boring name. After another equally dull name change, Titan was suggested. Now, unlike almost all of the other moons in the solar system, Titan isn't referring to a single person or deity, but a group of them. In Greek mythology, the Titans were a race, made up of the brothers and sisters of Kronos, also a Titan, and the Greek equivalent of the Roman god, Saturn. Hello. So where did Titan come from? It's thought that Titan was formed through a process called co-accretion, a method very similar to how our own solar system was formed. In their early stages, both Jupiter and Saturn were surrounded by huge clouds of dust. These clouds heated up, and the dust contained within them began to coalesce. Over time, the dust became rocks, and these rocks became bigger and heavier, and eventually grew into the moons we see today. But Titan has a slightly oval-shaped orbit around Saturn, which is something you don't really see in moons formed via co-accretion. To explain this, it's been suggested there were many Titan-sized moons all formed at once, all of whom were obliterated by a series of giant impacts. The debris from these smashed up moons then coalesced into Titan and placed it in its peculiar orbit. Side note, this is also the theory that explains the origin for some of Saturn's smaller moons such as Iapetus and Rhea. Not only is Titan the largest Saturnian moon, but it's also the second biggest moon in our solar system. The title of largest goes to the Jovian moon, Ganymede. However, Titan truly dwarfs all the other moons in the Saturn moon system, and is over three times bigger than the second largest Saturnian moon, Rhea. In fact, Titan is so big, it's comparable in size even to planets, and is 40% the size of Earth, three quarters the size of Mars, and even bigger than Mercury itself. So what is Titan made of? Based on the moon's density, we can infer that Titan is made up of one half water ice and one half rocky material. Like our own Earth and Moon, Titan is split into several layers surrounding a rocky core, where one of these layers is quite likely to be an underground ocean of liquid water. Now the prospect of an underground ocean on a distant moon is phenomenal, however that's nothing compared to what's happening on and above Titan's surface. For example, above Titan's south pole is a swirling vortex caused by the temperature differences in the Titanian atmosphere as the seasons change. Yeah, that's right, not only does Titan have an atmosphere, it also features the four season cycle like here on Earth. And Titan's atmosphere is thick, really thick, so thick that we cannot see any of its surface features without using radio or infrared imaging, just like with the planet Venus. To give you an idea of just how dense the atmosphere is on Titan, given the moon's low gravitational pull and the thickness of the air, if you were to add wings to your arms and flap about, you would actually fly like a bird. The titanium atmosphere is 98% nitrogen with the remaining 2% made mainly of methane, hydrogen and trace amounts of lots of other gases. Well you may be thinking Earth's atmosphere is mostly nitrogen, so why can I see all the way through our atmosphere but not through the one on Titan? This is because what little methane is present in the upper part of Titan's atmosphere is broken up by the sun's UV rays by a process called photodissociation, or photolysis. The methane is split into its base components of carbon and hydrogen, which then mix together to form other molecules called hydrocarbons, and it's these hydrocarbons that cause the orange smog that gives Titan its trademark haze. But calculations show the sun's energy would split up all the methane in Titan's atmosphere in roughly 50 million years. But Titan has been around for much longer than that, meaning something is replenishing the methane supply. There are currently three candidates for this methane source, all of which make Titan truly fascinating. The first source we'll look at are liquid lakes. That's right, there are dozens of liquid hydrocarbon lakes scattered across Titan's surface, where some are even big enough to be classed as seas. Kraken Mare, for example, named after the legendary sea beast, is 1,170 kilometers across, making it larger than the Caspian Sea here on Earth. Now, the average lake in Titan contains 75% ethane, 10% methane, and the rest is made of of other hydrocarbons such as butane and propane. 
due to the lack of sunlight on Titan, only one centimetre of liquid is evaporated per year, as opposed to one metre here on Earth. However, the atmosphere is so thick, it can hold up to 10 metres of liquid before it rains, whereas Earth's atmosphere can only hold a mere two centimetres, hence the unusually large amount of methane in Titan's atmosphere. So when it rains on Titan, it pours, and when it pours, you get rainbows, methane rainbows. However, as the atmosphere is so thick, hardly any sunlight can make it through, but infrared rays can, meaning you can totally see these rainbows if you had a pair of night vision goggles on. Possible methane source number two is volcanoes. However, these aren't the lava puking mountains you and I are familiar with, far from it in fact, and the volcanism present on Titan comes from cryovolcanoes, the frozen equivalent of a volcano which erupts an icy residue consisting of water, ammonia, and or methane, a concoction sometimes referred to as cryolava. Cryovolcanoes have been observed on other moons and dwarf planets, the best example coming from the fellow Saturnian moon of Enceladus. While there have been no direct observations of cryovolcanic eruptions on Titan, the effects of these eruptions have been measured. In 2006, the Cassini probe discovered an abundance of ammonia in the atmosphere when one of the cryovolcanoes was predicted to erupt. Although, some astronomers are not convinced that this ammonia came from the cryovolcanoes and the status of whether these volcanoes are still active or not is the subject of much debate in the astronomy community. One thing that everyone can agree on though is that cryovolcanoes are present on Titan and they've been photographed too. This is Doom Mons, one of Titan's largest mountain ranges with a cryovolcano at its peak and a distinct lava flow coming from it. I also wanted to mention this mountain range because it's named after Mount Doom from Lord of the Rings and that's pretty awesome. And now onto the third possible source of methane, life. Yeah, you heard me, there may be life on Titan. You see, on Earth, one of the biggest natural contributors to greenhouse gas emissions are cows, where just one bovine fart machine releases 70 to 120 kilograms of methane per year. Now, I'm not suggesting that there are herds of titanium cows roaming the plains and frolicking in the hydrocarbon lakes, but there could well be microscopic forms of life releasing methane into Titan's atmosphere. But, and it's a big but, conditions for life on Titan are hostile at best. For starters, the temperature on the surface is a frosty minus 179 degrees Celsius, meaning all all water on this chilly moon is frozen rock solid. See these rocks taken by the Huygens probe? Those aren't rocks, those are lumps of permafrost. For life to exist in the first place, you need liquid water to act as a solvent in which life can form, but thanks to Titan's icy cold climate, the chances of finding liquid water are damn near impossible. However, astrobiologists have suggested that the liquid hydrocarbon lakes could be a worthy substitute for water. If life were to exist in these lakes, it would live on very different substances to life here on Earth. Instead of inhaling oxygen, it would take in hydrogen, it would react with acetylene over glucose, and instead of breathing out carbon dioxide, it would breathe out the all-important methane we're looking for. Now, life hasn't been detected on Titan. However, the building blocks for life certainly have. With an abundance of hydrocarbons and just enough UV radiation from the sun to break them up using photolysis, there could be plenty of complex molecules present on the surface and in the clouds. Experiments carried out on Earth simulated photolysis on Titan's atmosphere and it found that amino acids and the five nucleotide bases, aka the building blocks for DNA and RNA, could indeed be created from the breakdown of hydrocarbons. So when will we know for sure if there's life on Titan? Well, not for a while unfortunately, but there have been many plans made in the past. NASA designed a hot air balloon to float around Titan's atmosphere for a couple of months, and someone suggested building a drone to do this as well. However, the interest clearly lies in Titan's lakes and seas, and in 2015, NASA awarded a Phase 2 grant for the design of a submarine to explore the Titan's seas and lakes. Now, given that this submarine is yet to be built, and it takes on average six years for a spacecraft to get to Saturn in the first place, it will be a couple of decades before we know for sure if there is indeed life on Titan.